incentives versus dispositions. If systemic causation is the dominant social force, that leaves much less of a role for the anointed, much less importance to the difference between their knowledge, wisdom, and virtue on the one hand, and the knowledge, wisdom, and virtue of ordinary people on the other. A downgrading of the importance of the special wisdom and virtue of any elite has been a feature of the tragic vision for centuries, going back at least as far as Hobbes in the 17th century and remaining a dominant note in the 20th century writings of Friedrich Hayek and others. According to Hobbes, a plain husbandman is more prudent in the affairs of his own house than a privy counselor in the affairs of other men. This conclusion reflected in part a belief that the incentives facing decision makers had much more to do with the quality of their decisions than differences in ability and virtue among them. It also suggested that these latter differences were exaggerated. Both beliefs have remained common for centuries among those with the tragic vision. Adam Smith thought that men differed from one another less than dogs. So did Friedrich Hayek two centuries later. Oliver Wendell Holmes likewise believed that great and conscientious minds had less impact on the law than might be supposed. He acknowledged the countless number of great intellects that have spent themselves in making some addition or improvement in the law, the greatest of which, he said, is trifling when compared to the mighty whole. Hayek applied this principle to social processes in general. Compared with the totality of knowledge which is continually utilized in the evolution of a dynamic civilization, the difference between the knowledge that the wisest and that which the most ignorant individual can deliberately employ is comparatively insignificant. The tragic vision of human limitations clearly applies to all, with no exception for any elite. Exempting the anointed from the systemic processes which produce legal traditions, social customs, market mechanisms, and other processes for expressing the life experiences of mankind becomes much more questionable in a world of systemic causation. The importance of the anointed's compassion or commitment to social justice is similarly reduced in a world where intentions are incidental and results depend much more on the kinds of social processes at work and the incentives generated by such processes. In their zeal for particular kinds of decisions to be made, those with the vision of the anointed seldom consider the nature of the process by which decisions are made. Often what they propose amounts to third-party decision-making by people who pay no cost for being wrong, surely one of the least promising ways of reaching decisions satisfactory to those who must live with the consequences. It is not that the anointed advocate such processes as such, but that their preoccupation with goals often neglects the whole question of process characteristics. The very standards by which social problems are defined tend likewise to be third-party standards. Thus, waste, quality, and real needs are terms blithely thrown around as if some third party can define them for other people. Government actions to enforce these third party preemptions are often advocated in the form of bureaucracies to replace the systemic processes of the marketplace. Such practices as judicial activism intended to produce socially more beneficial results than a strict adherence to legal rules and traditions might produce look very different within the framework of systemic causation. To derange a whole process evolved from the experiences of millions of people over centuries of legal development on the basis of the beliefs or feelings of a particular judge or set of judges about a particular issue before them risks raising up humanity in one place and pulling it down in another, to use Holmes's analogy. Hard cases make bad law is another way the tragic vision has been expressed. To help some hard-pressed individual or group whose case is before them, Judges may bend the law to arrive at a more benign verdict in that particular case, but at the cost of damaging the whole consistency and predictability of the law, on which millions of other people depend, and on which ultimately the freedom and safety of a whole society depend. There cannot be a law-abiding society if no one knows in advance what law they are to abide by, but must wait for judges to create ex post facto legal rulings based on evolving standards rather than known rules. An expanding penumbra of uncertainty surrounding laws creates incentives for a growing volume of litigation, as well as for a blackmailing of law-abiding individuals and organizations into out-of-court settlements because they cannot be sure how some speculative charge against them will be viewed by judges operating under evolving standards. 
In a system of human interactions, the incentives generated by those systems, whether economic systems or legal systems, for example, are crucial to those with the tragic vision. But those with the vision of the anointed see dispositions as crucial, and hence emphasize the inculcation of the proper attitudes through schools, the media, and otherwise. Whether the issue is child-rearing, criminal justice, or foreign policy, those with the tragic vision tend to rely on incentives, while those with the vision of the anointed tend to rely on creating favorable dispositions. Those with the vision of the anointed often advocate the settlement of international differences through diplomacy and negotiation rather than by force, as if diplomacy and negotiation were not dependent on a surrounding set of incentives, of which the credible threat of military force is crucial. Yet unilateral military cutbacks have often been advocated by those who favor diplomacy and negotiation. Indeed, such policies were not only advocated but followed by Western democracies for a dangerously long time during the period leading up to the outbreak of World War II. Among the social incentives of systemic interactions generated more or less spontaneously are personal ties within families, within communities, or among citizens of a given nation. All these systemically generated ties have been treated as precious sources of motivation and cohesion by those with the tragic vision, who see such ties as countering the inherent selfishness of individuals. Yet these same ties have aroused less enthusiasm, often suspicion, and sometimes even disdain or hostility by those with the vision of the anointed, to whom such particularistic ties are seen as obstacles to broader social interests or to being a citizen of the world. Once again, these different conclusions go back to underlying differences in the way the world is conceived and corresponding differences in what ranges of options are assumed to be available. To those with the vision of the anointed, the alternative to particularistic ties are universalistic ties, while to those with the tragic vision, the alternatives are individual egotism and mob psychology. Within the framework of systemic causation, proclamations of high principles and deep compassion are irrelevant distractions which promote a dangerous confusion between what you would like and what is likely to happen if what you advocate is put into practice. But those with the vision of the anointed tend automatically to attribute statistical differences between groups to intentional reasons, discrimination, or to dispositional reasons, racism, sexism, with seldom a serious thought about systemic reasons, such as age differences, cultural differences, or differences associated with childbearing and homemaking. It is considered an act of generosity if the latter reasons are not dismissed out of hand, but are accorded a perhaps. And all this without a speck of evidence being used to distinguish between these possibilities and those possibilities, whose only superior claims are based on their being part of the intentional and dispositional reasons at the heart of the vision of the anointed. Nowhere does the difference between systemic causation and intentional causation show up more dramatically than in discussions of racial issues. With such negative phenomena as racism, as with such positive phenomena as compassion, systemic causation does not depend simply on whether these dispositions exist, but on the situational incentives and constraints within which they exist. An owner of a professional basketball team and an owner of a symphony orchestra may be equally racist, but it would be financially suicidal for the former to refuse to hire black basketball players while the relatively few black symphonic musicians could be denied jobs with much less effect on the overall quality of a symphony orchestra or its financial viability. While these examples are hypothetical, empirical research in countries around the world shows repeatedly that discrimination is in fact more severe in those sectors of the economy where the costs incurred by the discriminators are less. Even in South Africa under apartheid, where racism among white employers was buttressed by legal discrimination against black workers. Those very employers often defied or evaded the apartheid laws to hire more blacks and in higher positions than permitted by the government. The South African housing market produced such racial integration in defiance of the law that whites were in some cases a minority in areas legally designated as being for whites only. Yet this whole field of the economics of discrimination has been dismissed as a lot of hot air by an academic whose sole evidence was a Federal Reserve study of mortgage lending in Boston, a study whose fatal flaws have already been noted in Chapter 3. For many others with the vision of the anointed, no evidence at all is necessary for asserting that racism and discrimination underlie statistical disparities. In contrast to the vision of the anointed, systemic causation says that there are often underlying and quite rational reasons for decisions, 
even if the expression of those reasons are neither obvious nor well articulated. In short, there is an underlying reality reflected through systemic processes, however imperfectly. It is not simply a matter of subjective dispositions. This reasoning can be taken a step further. A fundamental reality is not vitiated by the fact that different human beings see it differently, even if some respond irrationally. For example, in 19th century Japan, the fundamental reality was that the Japanese were technologically far behind the Western industrial nations and that this had enormous implications for the country's military vulnerability, political subordination, and chances of survival as an independent nation. A wide spectrum of Japanese recognized this and acted upon it, ultimately creating the scientific, technological, and economic foundation for Japan's emergence a century later as one of the leading industrial nations of the world. However, not every Japanese was perfectly rational about their initial shock at discovering how far behind they were compared to the West. Among the reactions were these. Associations were formed to promote the use of Roman letters in the writing of Japanese and to abandon the kanji and kana characters. Suggestions were made that the kimono be abolished, along with many Japanese foods. One man, Yoshio Takahashi, even published a book, The Improvement of the Japanese Race, in which he claimed that the Japanese were physically and mentally inferior to Westerners, and he urged that all Japanese males divorce their wives and marry Western women who would bear children with superior characteristics and so improve the Japanese stock. A song composed in 1878 for children as they played with a ball called the Civilization Ball Song was designed to impress on their young minds how superior Western technology was. At each bounce of the ball, they had to recite the names of ten objects that would improve their country. Gas lamps, steam engines, horse-drawn carriages, cameras, telegrams, lightning conductors, newspapers, schools, letter post, and steamships. Nothing would be easier than to ridicule some of these attitudes. Certainly no one today could consider the Japanese race mentally inferior, for example, after their remarkable achievements in overtaking Western nations technologically in just one century, but a sweeping dismissal of the concerns behind even these extreme reactions in 19th century Japan would be as mistaken in general as these reactions were on particular points. There was an underlying reality, however varied and sometimes irrational the subjective responses were to it. It was not just a matter of subjective dispositions, nor would psychological re-education of the Japanese or redefining the backwardness of 19th century Japan out of existence with cultural relativism have made a dent in that underlying reality. Everything cannot be reduced to psychological attitudes or perceptions. Systemic causation does not presuppose perfect rationality on the part of human beings. On the contrary, its rationality is a systemic rationality such that any professional basketball team owner who refused to hire black players under competitive market conditions would simply not continue to survive as an owner. Similarly, systemic causation would not explain the highly varying proportions of female employees in different industries and occupations by the subjective attitudes of men in those particular industries and occupations, but by the varying situations in those sectors of the economy where women are prevalent or rare. It would, in fact, be an incredible coincidence if men's attitudes toward women should continue to be radically different from one industry to another over a span of time sufficient for a complete turnover of the men in all the industries. The point here is not to resolve issues involving women or minorities in the labor market. The point is to illustrate the difference between seeking systemic explanations of social phenomena and presupposing that subjective dispositions provide a sufficient causal explanation. A spectrum of subjective responses to any situation is virtually inevitable, and these responses will almost invariably include both wise and foolish reactions, as well as reactions well articulated and clumsily expressed. Nothing would be easier on any issue than to seize upon foolish, malign, or confused statements or actions in order to present a social problem as due to subjective dispositions which differ from the superior dispositions of the anointed. But if causation is seen as systemic rather than dispositional, then the task is to discover the underlying reality behind the varied subjective expressions. Perceptions are like mirrors which reflect the real world with varying degrees of distortion, but proving distortion does not disprove the existence of a reality which cannot be talked away.